Catherine, we're normally in the ITIC office together watching the budget or indeed maybe Buzzwells. Um, but this year, obviously, it's all by Zoom. But it was it was a pretty good week, wasn't it, for, for Irish tourism, considering how difficult and challenging things have been? Um, considering all things, yeah, it was. I mean, this has been an absolute roller coaster of a year. Earlier on in the year, we were sitting down with great hopes when we were talking about Tourism Day, making plans for that. And then little did we know that we'd get the call in early March um, to say that St. Patrick's Day Festival was off. You know, things were beginning to shut down. And it was only at that stage, really, that what had seemed at one point to be a very far distant remote problem um, suddenly was right on our doorsteps. And um, I think on that day, um, early March, I think it was about the 10th of March, when the St. Patrick's Day Festival was cancelled. And at that point, we knew things were never yeah, going to be the same yeah. again. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think we, 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 we quickly sort of worked out that tourism and hospitality, our, our sector was, was going to be disproportionately impacted by the, the COVID pandemic. And unfortunately, it proved the case because it was an absolutely dreadful summer. There was a little bit of a staycation bounce over maybe July and August, but no international tourists. And of course, now we're facing into a, a long, cold winter. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, it, 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 it sounds almost tried to say it because we've said it so many times over the summer that tourism we knew was going to be first and hardest hit and then slow to recover but I think that what the industry did was at least we galvanized that message very early and we communicated from the outset we are going to need some help here and it was one of the final um, one of the final achievements really of Shane Ross who was the outgoing minister for tourism that he took the step to set up the, um, the Tourism Recovery Task Force and the Aviation Task Force, recognising this was a problem that wasn't going to be solved anytime fast or anytime yeah. soon. So that was, a, that was a very proactive step, I feel, that he took at the time. The Tourism Recovery Task Force was appointed. And crucially, you know, ITIC had, had pushed for this. There was an independent chair. And to give Minister Shane Ross and Minister Brendan Griffin, who were there at the time, their, their due, they actually picked the ITIC chair, Ruth Andrews. And, and they did an awful lot of work over the summer months, if you like, bringing together... Uh, all the stakeholders within tourism and coming out with a really good report, which crucially was published and submitted to cabinet a week before the budget. Yeah, there was there was a lot of um, a lot of issues and a lot of timing and a lot of decisions that I suppose um, went our way that could so easily not have gone our way. But you really needed people who could spot straight away this is going to be a major challenge and we need to get to work very quickly. So I think we were extremely fortunate. Not just that it was an ITIC person, but that it was someone with the depth of experience and the, the highest regard across the industry as Ruth, who really you know led from the front, which is a terrific asset to us. Yeah, absolutely. She did a great job. And I, I just think the timing of it, just to get such a good report done within a five month period, which is a short uh, amount of time and actually submitted to cabinet pre-budget actually helped us get a lot over the line. I think was what was particularly valuable was that ITIC managed to get the industry and all the sectoral bodies to coalesce around a few short messages and all the industry bodies, all the sector associations actually repeated that mantra throughout the summer. And it helped us, if you like, um, amplify uh, both the crisis that tourism was suffering, but also the kind of constructive solutions that, that were there if the government chose to adopt them. Yeah, so what ITIC did was, I mean, ITIC has you know, over 30 representative organizations and galvanizing all the voices of those members into a very, very clear message at a very early, early stage was very important because it would have been an impossible task to, uh, to move forward otherwise. Absolutely. We, we were disappointed, I think, with the July stimulus package, which, which didn't do a lot for, for tourism and hospitality. So if you like, we, we, we focused all our energies on the budget and, and, and moving, moving forward to the budget. I think there was, there was widespread, if you like, uh, support and, and welcoming for the budget measures as announced by Ministers Donoghue and McGrath. Um, the VAT cut to 9%, the COVID restriction support scheme. Fortune Ireland getting a, 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 a grant of, of 55 million euro for business continuity. The commercial rates were, were, were waived until the, the, through until December. Uh, and indeed, the, uh, the employment wage subsidy scheme was extended through to the end of next year. I know they weren't all perfect. Like, for example, the VAT is only for 14 months. We'd like that for a much longer period of time. The commercial rates really need to be pushed through to the middle of next summer. Ideally, the employment wage subsidy scheme would have been enhanced as opposed to just extended. But still, they were big wins. And, and I suppose it gives hope to a lot of tourism and hospitality businesses out there that they can get through this, this winter period. 
Yeah, I certainly know from speaking to people earlier on this week and at the end of last week where the lobbying was at its most intense um, that tourism businesses across all the sectors genuinely feel this was an absolutely critical moment. I mean, this was the darkest hour moment. And I was speaking to people on Monday, the day before the, um, the budget, and there was this awful sense of nervousness and dread, like there was a fear that perhaps it wouldn't come to pass. And we had heard some soundings from the department that, um, that you know, the talk was of VAT at 9%. And that, and we just weren't sure what else might be there. That if that if that was all, what were we going to do next? Um, I mean, speaking particularly to, you know, to hoteliers that had occupancy levels that had never been seen before, businesses that had been shuttered, um, rolling county lo lockdowns. It just seemed facing into the winter was going to be absolutely impossible. Yeah. And particularly after, you know, the July stimulus had got us so far. But really, there was a sense that the budget was make or break time. And I don't mean that in any dramatic sense, but in an absolute factual sense that organisations would not be able to make any sort of plan to, to open or to close um, without any sort of certainty coming out of the budget. And the one thing that it did bring was a great degree of certainty. So we have, a, we, you know, we have a, a start date for the VAT rate. We have an end date. We might prefer that to be a longer end date. And um, we have a, a current date for the wage subsidy scheme. You know, we would hope that that would go on a little bit further. And we do need to have, if there are going to be changes to that, make sure there's a well-flagged transition period, make sure that nothing happens suddenly, make sure that we're prepared, making sure that it happens at a time, if it happens, that it happens at a time when our cash flow is starting to come back again. So, um, so we would be hoping, we're looking for aiming for a good season next summer. Um, at that point, we may be ready to transition off, but it's important that those decisions aren't taken just on the basis of a calendar without thinking of the, you know, the business setups and their business mix. Absolutely. And the CRS was an interesting one as well, because it was something we, we pushed for. Effectively, it's a, it's a compensation scheme for businesses that have been closed or heavily impacted by COVID. And of course, the tourism and hospitality family is, 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 is front and center amongst that. So whether it's attractions or restaurants or tour operators, there's a lot of businesses that effectively have seen their, their income go, go to virtually zero. Uh, and, and the idea of getting as much as 5,000 euro a week would be of huge benefit, but we have to make sure that that works for the industry. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, each business at least now they know that they're that 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 is coming down the tracks because when that wasn't on the table, businesses were trying to operate on this level of brinkmanship. Am I going to be closed tomorrow? Am I going to be open? Are we at level two? Are we at level three? And just the uncertainty that that creates that it was impossible to plan into you know the next week or the the next month. And that some businesses were, were staying open on the hope of generating some cash flow, but at least now they can take an informed decision on what to do next. Because it does look like for some businesses, it may be a winter of hibernation. For others, they may continue to trade through. But at least now they have a certainty. Um, they, have, they have the information there that will help them make their decisions. Absolutely. And, and I suppose we, we you know, we're, we're, we're slightly encouraged, if you like, by the budgetary measures. But, but I, I think and nobody's naive enough uh, to, to, to suggest that, you know, this isn't going to be a, a really challenging period of time. I mean, we heard the Ryanair news just, just this morning confirming they're, they're pulling out of Cork and Shannon. Mm -hmm. Cork and Shannon, I think, got five million euro each uh, in, in the budget, which is to be welcomed. But obviously the Ryanair decision is, is, is an absolute hammer blow. Uh, but there's a, there's a huge uh, mountain to climb. And I think what we need, we need to turn on demand again. I think what was welcome also this week was that Ireland in principle adopted the EU uh, common uh, traffic light system for travel. Now, the devil's in the detail there as well, because Ireland needs to do an awful lot more on testing to, mm. to, to make that worthwhile. But we maybe have a structure in place that will allow international travel to resume next year. And that's fundamental to the health of Irish tourism. Absolutely. I mean, you know, with the, the, we're, we've had to look at two things here without going too technical. I mean, you've got you've got the micro, so you've got all your product all over Ireland, you've got all your, you know, your, your as I mentioned, the B&Bs and the self-caterings and the restaurants and, you know, the visitor attractions and experiences, the hotels that are there. And you want to make sure that they are able to survive and that they're in existence for the day that we do reopen for business and that um, that there is a, like a, a fabulous holiday experience here to be had when international visitors do come. So there's a very, very important job to be done there in protecting what we have and making sure that those assets as they're called I think they were referred to in um, in one of the reports this week so I mean they're very important assets to our tourism product 
And then that's on the one side. And then on the other side is how are visitors going to get here? How safe is, it, is Ireland going to be perceived internationally? Um, I feel it's a good thing to be part of an agreed international framework that we're not going to be an outlier. Um, and that it also you know, encourages us to, to, um, to meet up to other countries' standards, you know, yeah. whatever internationally, then um, you know, it's, it's helpful to have that in place because everybody knows what expectations are there and yeah. how to do it. So obviously, you know, a, a, um, a, a traffic light system can only operate if there's a supporting testing regime in place. And that has to be looked at very, you know, very carefully. Um, how's that going to be implemented? Is it going to be done via airports? Is it going to be done via airlines or carriers? How is that going to be handled? And these things need to be thought through because at some point we need to be open for business. We need to be ready to open for business. Um, we're not quite at that time now, but we absolutely can't wait we, we have to make those preparations and have a plan at this point. I, I completely agree. And, and, and the domestic market in Ireland is, is just not big enough or large enough or strong enough to sustain the industry here. If we look back to, to June, Catherine, ITIC actually spent a, a, a lot of work putting together a, a revival plan, which was well received and actually in many ways set the agenda that we've seen uh, come to fruition to a certain extent this week in the budget. But the work doesn't stop now just because we've, we've got a, a couple of positive measures with the budget. There's still an awful lot of work which we, as, as, as the industry body, but also the, the various sectors and the individual tourism and hospitality businesses will need to do over the winter months to make sure we get through this, what is still an existential crisis. Yes, it's important though when, um, I mean, when we think back to the revival plan, which we launched in June, and it seems a long time ago now, but that plan always had an eye to the future. It didn't have an eye to the short term or the medium term, but it was very much on what or how long is it going to take to get us back to the level of businesses that we were at in 2018, 2019? What are the steps that are going to have to be taken and what are the key measures that we literally have to lobby for, advocate for, and make sure we never take our eyes off that particular prize? Mm -hmm. So that was a very important decision that early you know, it coalesced around these, these key ideas. So over the last number of months, obviously we've had very close dealings with um, the tourism agencies, Falter Ireland and Tourism Ireland, who have two roles, um, very important roles going forward. So Falter Ireland have been working very closely with the industry to make sure that they're putting in all the supports. And I do know that they have worked tirelessly, um, literally around the clock, um, reaching out as much as they can, making online supports available, financial supports available, funds available, um, and I know that they're working very closely. They will be working very closely with the department in terms of whatever um, mechanism is agreed for disbursement of the, the, um, the business continuity grants. So that's going to be a very important role. And uh, naturally, there'll be a lot of work done on that. And in addition to that, Tourism Ireland have been keeping you know, all the relationships warm overseas. While they can't go out and say, come to Ireland now, they've, they've um, done some fantastic and creative marketing work um, and also, you know, um, uh, online work with their overseas agents, just making sure that when, when the time comes for us to put the open sign back over Ireland, that, uh, that all of those relationships have been, have been maintained over the quiet months, um, that our marketing has been strong, our international perception is very strong. And I think that according to their metrics, um, Ireland still rates very highly as an attractive destination to come to. So it's been a lot of hard work done against massive odds and with massive demands on their time. So I think a lot of kudos to the agencies and, at this time. Great. Thanks, Catherine.